Thank you Stephen for your presentation, as I have said there are several issues on which I would take issue with you philosophically and also with respect to your interpretation of what a systems view is. My intention, in my presentation, is not to debate and seek through rhetoric to persuade our audience. Rather, it is to look at the data and to see if your arguments are supported by the data we have. Your talk is from your paper in 2000 so almost 20 years have elapsed since then, and of course since the first limits to growth published by the Club of Rome, of which you are a member of the Canadian branch, some 50 years have passed. First of all I would like to define some scientific terms, outline some concepts and pose some hypothetical questions. Linguistics. Why isn't prosequences a word? Answer 1. There's pros and cons and consequences, no prosequences, I pronounce it like prosecute. I am aware con means with, and it's with a sequence, but most of the time it's always used negatively. Why doesn't prosequence exist then? How did pros slash cons arise in relation to consequences, and is it just coincidence that they're similar? Answer 2. Pro et contra means for and against in Latin. That's where pros and cons come from. Consequent, late 14c, inference, conclusion, from old French consequence results, 13c, modern French consequence, from Latin consequentia, from consequentum, nominative consequence, present participle of consequita follow after, from com with, secom, plus sequita follow, c sequel. Sense of importance, circa 1600, is from notion of being pregnant with consequences. The con in consequence does not have the same origin as the con in pro slash con. Consequence means important things follow after not negative things follow after. Experiential, sensory perception. The five senses. Ah. Smell, sight, hearing, touch, taste. Additionally there is. The sense of space. In addition to the traditional big five, there is another sense that deals with how your brain understands where your body is in space. This sense is called proprioception. Additional senses and variations. There are more subtle senses that most people never really perceive. For example, there are neuron sensors that sense movement to control balance and the tilt of the head. Specific kinesthetic receptors exist for detecting stretching in muscles and tendons, helping people to keep track of their limbs. Other receptors detect levels of oxygen in certain arteries of the bloodstream. Sometimes, people don't even perceive senses the same way. People with synesthesia can see sounds as colors or associate certain sights with smells, for example. In science there are also contradictory or problematical concepts such as wave-particle duality. There are also energy fields to consider these fields are magnetic and electrical. We also have the question as to. Is light pure energy? Light, energy. Akil, materials engineer. Answer 1. Light is pure energy. Dot electromagnetic radiation is energy. Depending on the quantity of photons, the building blocks of light, the intensity of the energy will vary. Depending on the frequency of the photons, the energy of the photons will, will vary. Therefore, individual photons of visible light will have more energy than infrared, microwaves or radio waves. On the other hand, visible light photons of less energy than gamma and X-rays, and UV light. All forms of M radiation are pure energy. There are also other forms that can be considered pure energy as well. Velocity is kinetic energy, heat is thermal energy and so on. Not all type of energy are capable of easily doing work on other one environments, and therefore not all forms of energy are usable. Peter Goetkint, PhD Physical Sciences, via University at Brussels, 1992. Answer 2. Q, is light pure energy? A, I'm a physicist, and the question is not precise for me as I have no definition of the purity of energy in physics. The SI unit for energy is the joule. A single photon of light has a certain equivalence in joule, so yes light carries energy, but a light beam also has other properties such as direction, frequency, phase and polarization. These are typical properties of light, but rarely associated with energy. Only the frequency and the amounts of photons define the energy that is carried. Scientific models, and the probabilistic turn in physics. 
I like Hans Rosling's possibilism, the very first statistics lecture I ever attended was preceded by the lecturer with the old joke about lies, damned lies, and statistics. Even in statistics motivation on context are inherent in the boundary conditions. Whilst the dismal science, as faith-based humanity, is really metaphysical, a second law-free zone with no use for evidence, we will remain in what Bruce Charlton calls, the insanity of pure abstract altruism. Pure disinterested altruism, imposed on all by abstract systems, is, therefore, a logical consequence of the moral primacy of pure altruism. It is also insane and lacks any test in reality. PC is good by definition and for no other reason, especially not because PC has been found to be good. PC stands or falls by the fact of a secular intellectual ruling elite, and can be imposed widely by this elite only by the recent technologies of modern mass media, and PC is only possible in a fully materialist and secular society, where this worldly goods and their just, i.e. altruistic, allocation can assume ultimate importance, overriding all other considerations, such as the saving of souls. HTTP colon slash slash thought prison PC dot blogspot dot com slash. The Scientific Academy has succumbed to the Rovian actors in history syndrome as described by Ron Suskind. The aide said that guys like me were in what we call the reality based community, which he defined as people who believe that solutions emerge from your judicious study of discernible reality. I nodded and murmured something about enlightenment principles and empiricism. He cut me off. That's not the way the world really works anymore. He continued we're an empire now, and when we act, we create our own reality. And while you're studying that reality, judiciously, as you will, we'll act again, creating other new realities, which you can study too, and that's how things will sort out. We're history's actors, and you, all of you, will be left to just study what we do. Suskind, Ron, the 17th of October 2004. Faith certainty and the presidency of George W. Bush. The New York Times Magazine. https colon slash slash longhead musings dot wordpress dot com slash 2017 slash show 5 slash show 6 slash the Rovian turn in election punditry lies damned lies and statistics Corbin 4 p.m. slash. Every living thing can become healthy, strong and fruitfully within a horizon, if it is incapable of Drawing a horizon around itself or, on the other hand, too selfish to restrict its vision to the limits of the horizon drawn by another, it will wither away feebly or over hastily to its early demise. Cheerfulness, clear conscience, the carefree deed, faith in the future, all this depends in the case of an individual as well as of a people, on there being a line which distinguishes what is clear and in full view from the dark and unilluminable, it depends on one's being able to forget at the right time as well as to remember at the right time, on discerning with strong instinctual feelings when there is need to experience historically and when unhistorically. Precisely this is the proposition the reader is invited to consider. The unhistorical and the historical are equally necessary for the health of an individual, a people and a culture. Friedrich Nietzsche, 1844-1900. On the advantage and disadvantage of history for life. HTTPS colon slash slash the conquest of do dot weebly dot com slash on the chronology of human society dot html. Convention. HTTP colon slash slash www.princeton.edu slash tilde harman slash courses slash phi 534-2012-13 slash anove 26 slash lewis convention 1.pdf. Yet, in the end, the theory of games is scaffolding. I can restate my analysis of convention without it. The result is a theory along the lines of Hume's in his discussion of the origin of justice and property, convention turns out to be for the strategy of conflict. Cambridge, Massachusetts, Harvard University Press, 1960. 4. Introduction. A general sense of common dot interest, which sends all the members of the society expressed to one another, and which induces them to regulate their conduct by certain rules. I observe that it will be to my interest, for example, 
to leave another in the possession of his goods, provided he will act in the same manner with regard to me. Foucault. The episteme. I would define the episteme retrospectively as the strategic apparatus which permits of separating out from among all the statements which are possible those that will be acceptable within, I won't say a scientific theory, but a field of scientificity, and which it is possible to say are true or false. The episteme is the apparatus which makes possible the separation, not of the true from the false, but of what may from what may not be characterized as scientific. 1. Michel Foucault. Whenever you get two people interpreting the same data in different ways, that's metaphysics. Is a quote from an interview published in Scientific American with Thomas Kuhn the coiner of the term and proposer of the concept of paradigm shifts. I think Rupert Sheldrake sums up the science republic, Pollyanni, best though with his science delusion TED talk. Big G Rupert Sheldrake. From 948. Anyway. That's my own hypothesis in a nutshell of morphic resonance. Everything depends on evolving habits not on fixed laws. But I want to spend a few moments on the constants of nature too. Because these are, again, assumed to be constant. Things like the gravitational constant of the speed of light are called the fundamental constants. Are they really constant? Well, when I got interested in this question, I try to find out. They're given in physics handbooks. Handbooks of physics list the existing fundamental constants, tell you their value. But I wanted to see if they'd changed, so I got the old volumes of physical handbooks. I went to the patent office library here in London, they're the only place I could find that kept the old volumes. Normally people throw them away when the new values, volumes, come out, they throw away the old ones. When I did this I found that the speed of light dropped between 1928 and 1945 by about 20 kilometers per second. It's a huge drop because they're given with errors of any fractions of a second slash decimal points of error. And yet, all over the world, it dropped, and they were all getting very similar values to each other with tiny errors. Then in 1948, it went up again. And then people started getting very similar values again. I was very intrigued by this and I couldn't make sense of it, so I went to see the head of metrology at the National Physical Laboratory in Teddington. Metrology is the science in which people measure constants. And I asked him about this, I said what do you make of this drop in the speed of light between 1928 and 1945? And he said oh dear, he said you've uncovered the most embarrassing episode in the history of our science. So I said well, could the speed of light have actually dropped? and that would have amazing implications if so. He said no, no, of course it couldn't have. Actually dropped. It's a constant. Oh, well then how do you explain the fact that everyone was finding it going much slower during that period? Is it because they were fudging their results to get what they thought other people should be getting and the whole thing was just produced in the minds of physicists? We don't like to use the word fudge. I said well, so what do you prefer? He said well, we prefer to call it intellectual phase locking. So I said well if it was going on then, how can you be so sure it's not going on today? And the present values P reduced are by intellectual phase locking? And he said oh we know that's not the case. And I said how do we know? He said well, he said we've solved the problem. And I said well how? And he said well we fixed the speed of light by definition in 1972. So I said but it might still change. He said yes, but we'd never know it, because we've defined the meter in terms of the speed of light, so the units would change with it. So he looked very pleased about that, they'd fixed that problem. Whenever you get two people interpreting the same data in different ways, that's metaphysics. Is a quote from an interview published in Scientific American with Thomas Kuhn the coiner of the term and proposer of the concept of paradigm shifts. HTTPS colon slash slash blogs dot scientific American dot com slash cross check slash what Thomas Kuhn really thought about scientific truth slash Stevens paper is summarized for him in a monument known as the Georgia Guidestones the inscribed summary is this maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature 1 guide reproduction wisely improving fitness and diversity 2 Unite humanity with a living new language. 3. Rule passion, faith, tradition, 
and all things with tempered reason. 4. Protect people and nations with fair laws and just courts. 5. Let all nations rule internally resolving external disputes in a world court. 6. Avoid petty laws and useless officials. 7. Balance personal rights with social duties. 8. Prize truth, beauty, love, seeking harmony with the infinite. 9. Be not a cancer on the earth, leave room for nature, leave room for nature. Regarding the data on population and taking Ehrlich's paper which Stephen quotes we find this. At present, world energy use amounts to about 13 terawatts, TW, 1012 watts, about 70% of which is being used to support somewhat over a billion people in rich countries and 30% to support more than 4 billion people in developing countries. This pattern is clearly unsustainable, not only because of the gross disparity between rich and poor societies, but because of the environmental damage that results. The consumption of 13 TW of energy with current technologies is leading not only to the serious environmental impacts indicated above but also to several forms of destabilizing global change, including a continuous deterioration of ecosystems and the essential services they render to civilization, Ehrlich and Ehrlich. 1991, Ehrlich et al., 1993. Here is a graph of world energy use in terms of terawatt hours. An examination of probable future trends leads to dismal conclusions. The world population is projected to increase from 5.5 billion in 1993 to somewhere between 10 and 14 billion within the next century. Suppose population growth halted at 14 billion and everyone was satisfied with a per capita energy use of 7.5 kilowatts, kW, the average in rich nations and about two-thirds of that in the I. In the early 1990s, a human enterprise that large would create a total impact of 105 TW, eight times that of today and a clear recipe for ecological collapse. Against that background, what might be said about the upper limits on an optimum population size, considering present attitudes and technologies? In view of the environmental impacts of a civilization using 13 TW today, to say nothing of the threats to the future prospects of humanity, it is difficult to visualize a sustainable population that used more than 9 TW. To summarize this brief essay, determination of an optimum world population size involves social decisions about the lifestyles to be lived and the distribution of those lifestyles among individuals in the population. To us it seems reasonable to assume that, until cultures and technologies change radically, the optimum size of the human population lies in the vicinity of 1.5 to 2 billion people. That number also is our approximate best guess of the continuous standing crop of people, if achieved reasonably soon, that would permit the maximum number of Homo sapiens to live in the long run. But suppose we have underestimated the optimum and it actually is 4 billion? Since the present population is over 5.5 billion and growing rapidly, the initial policy implications of our conclusions are still clear. End times prophesy is nothing new. It sells newspapers and allows politicians easy sound bites. Regarding self-evident truths I like this from the anonymous response to the publication of the U.S. Declaration of Independence penned by Jeremy Bentham. They are about to assume, as they tell us, among the powers of the earth, that equal and separate, 120, station to which, they have lately discovered, the laws of nature, and of nature's God entitle them. What difference these acute legislators suppose between the laws of nature and of nature's God? is more than I can take upon me to determine, or even to guess. If to what they now demand they were entitled by any law of God, they had only to produce that law, and all controversy was at an end. Instead of this, what do they produce? What they call self-evident truths. All men, they tell us, are created equal. This rarity is a new discovery, now, for the first time, we learn, that a child, at the moment of his birth, has the same quantity of natural power as the parent, the same quantity of political power as the magistrate. Stephen quotes many people as appeals to authority this is unsurprising as no evidence exists to support the wild assertions made and falsified over and again. Nicolas Blombergen, Nobel winner in physics and Harvard professor, said in a presentation to colleagues, 
Would a total world population of about 1 billion as existed 200 years ago represent a reasonable compromise between quantity and quality of human life? The answer, clearly involves value judgments. Blombergen, 1996. J. Kenneth Smail, Professor of Anthropology and Sociology at Kenyon College in Ohio, as an argument for a sustainable optimum of approximately 2 billion by the beginning of the 23rd century. He presents much evidence that mere stabilization during the 21st century will result in a future demographic catastrophe. Smail, 1995. Udall's essay calls for the establishment of a direct-to-the-people non-profit organization financed by a consortium of billionaires. It would be primarily locally staffed, and deliver women-to-women -women reproductive health services to the poorest nations of the world. The Ted Turner, Bill Gates, George Soros. Rockefeller, Packard, and many other foundations have recognized the importance of this issue. It may well be that those enmeshed in fierce economic competition are blinkered by their focus to succeed, while those who are very rich have the opportunity to step back and look farther into the future. A trillion dollars in assets passed to progeny can't by itself guarantee them a peaceful planet, clean air and water, delicious healthy food, and the joys of a diverse natural environment. A second, and not previously mentioned challenge is the need for system science methodology to grow worldwide and to ultimately replace irrational, power-based approaches to social organization. Overpopulation is but one of the global issues we must address, and the principle of the weak link applies to the whole system. A critic of another of Stevens' reviews on the layman's book on overpopulation as an extant truth as opposed to a theoretical problem said this. I question the popular assumption that our destruction of the environment and our overpopulation are to be attributed to our religious beliefs. I am not sure we need any more explanation than small span of perception, narrow sphere of self-interest, and short time horizon in other words a lack of imagination, or deficiency of thinking span. An aspect of our hard wiring, perhaps, I confess to a dissatisfaction with the classical scientific framework which confines discourse to what can be found within the realm of the five senses, i.e. the material realm. Václav Smil, not the Smil, Stephen mistakenly said he had quoted, as Smil, in the subject paper to which I am making this response, says this of the polarities of the two schools of thought on overpopulation. Extreme carrying capacity estimates go far outside the broad, fourfold range bracketed by the estimates just cited. They have been defined by true believers in the antipodal camps of catastrophist and cornucopian futures. A generation ago Ehrlich, 1968, wrote that the battle to feed all humanity is over and that hundreds of millions of people are going to starve to death during the 1970s. To Ehrlich's global population maximum would have to be well below the 1970 total of about 3.7 billion people. In contrast, Simon, 1981, maintain that food has no long run, physical limit. These extremes leave us either with the prospect of eliminating about half of humanity I in order to return the worldwide count to a sub-portable level or with visions of crop harvests surpassing the mass of the planet itself. Three is Sovi, 1990 1949, 774, noted crisply, lack of precision in data and in method of analysis allows shortcuts toward reaching an objective predetermined by prejudice shaped largely either by faith in progress or by conservative skepticism. Unfortunately, less extreme estimates have been hardly more impressive. Because the question of the ultimate support capacity cannot have a single correct answer, assessing the value of past estimates must be done by looking at their assumptions. Too many of them are overly simplistic, and even the more elaborate ones are usually difficult to defend. In general, the capacity predictions assume too much as well as too little. Most notably, they almost completely ignore the demand side of the question. Václav Smil The requirement for growth in financialized capitalism is due to interest, usually, and the way money is created and what metrics it is assayed by a very important the work of Kreutz in the money syndrome and of the late Margaret Kennedy is essential to understanding this point. My dialogue with Clive Lord a founding member of the Green Party of England and Wales on money, usually, and citizens' basic income goes into the subject in some detail Clive is a believer in the doctrines of the tragedy of the commons. 
the application of particular examples by extrapolation to claims of universal application are a typical feature of the Malthusian, dystopian, humanity as a plague worldview. Much of the writing on the issue is speculative hypothesis and as such exegesis is the proper analytic tool and falsification in the scientific Popperian sense does not apply as the dogmas and catechisms of Malthusian dystopian eschatology lends the subject to the techniques of literary criticism and comparative literature and comparative religion. Showalter's controversial take on illnesses such as dissociative identity disorder, formerly called multiple personality disorder, Gulf War Syndrome and Chronic Fatigue Syndrome in her book Histories, Hysterical Epidemics and Modern Media, 1997, comes to mind it could apply equally well to the consensus-based policy lead evidence making of overpopulation and the settled seance of anthropogenic slash anthropocentric global warming. All the evidence today shows that what was once a potential problem theoretically has not materialized into a problem and whilst there are areas of bounded difficulties the bi-pragmatic and applied know-how and technology modern production and farming can solve the problems that really exist. The invented, imagined and exaggerated problems based upon conjecture and appealing to the authority of consensus are not matters of settled science but matters of politics and vested interests and sophistry. Attributes of Science 1. Science is a branch of knowledge. 2. Science is the objective branch of knowledge. 3. Science e is ultimately shared, public, knowledge. 4. Scientific models account for all relevant facts in their domain. 5. Scientific models predict new phenomena or relationships. 6. Predictions of qualitatively new results must be validated. 7. Basic science is the branch of science in the domain of the natural world. 8. Technology is the branch of science in the domain of man-made objects and processes, that serves man by extending his senses and his span of control. 9. Science is the application of the scientific method. Defining Science Registered 2009 J.A. Glassman George Perkins Marsh had an altogether more measured both in tone and metrologic senses. All nature is linked together by invisible bonds and every organic creature, however low, however feeble, however dependent, is necessary to the well-being of some other among the myriad forms of life. Man has too long forgotten that the earth was given to him for usufruct alone, not for consumption, still less for profligate waste. George Perkins Marsh Sight is a faculty, seeing is an art. Ah. George Perkins Marsh Wherever modern science has exploded a superstitious fable or even a picturesque error, she has replaced it with a grander and even more poetical truth. George Perkins Marsh https colon slash slash www.thisquotes.com slash author slash 24677 George underscore Perkins underscore Marsh Seeds is a part of the solution to the current problem. I personally think, as you know, that seeds needs to be coupled with an embodied energy index that will then translate to an empirically falsifiable value scale for the pricing of monetary exchanges. A joke. Heisenberg, Odell, and Chomsky walk into a bar. Heisenberg looks around the bar and says, because there are three of us and because this is a bar, it must be a joke. But the question remains, is it funny or not? And Goodell thinks for a moment and says, well, because we're inside the joke. We can't tell whether it is funny. We'd have to be outside looking at it. And Chomsky looks at both of them and says, Of course it's funny. You're just telling it wrong. Usually as opposed to the practice of usefruct is the great problem of overproduction. Overproduction is not a function of overpopulation but the necessity for growth is driven by usury and creating an artificial shortage for the unit of account. This truth about the counterpoint between debt-based money and real wealth is alluded to in a memorable scene from the film Good Will Hunting written by Matt Damon and Ben Affleck. They were, as young men growing up in Boston part of the academic network with Howard Zinn and Noam Chomsky at its heart. Here's the bar scene dialogue. Will, Matt Damon, of course that's your contention. You're a first-year grad student. You just got finished reading some Marxian historian, Pete Garrison probably. 
you're gonna be convinced of that till next month when you get to James Lemon, and then you're gonna be talking about how the economies of Virginia and Pennsylvania were entrepreneurial and capitalist way back in 1740. That's gonna last until next year, you're gonna be in here regurgitating Gordon Wood, talking about, you know, the pre-revolutionary utopia and the capital-forming effects of military mobilization. Wood drastically, Wood drastically underestimates the impact of social distinctions predicated upon wealth, especially inherited wealth. Got that from Vickers, work in Essex County, page 98, right? Yeah, I read that too. Were you gonna plagiarize the whole thing for us? Do you have any thoughts of your own on this matter? Or do you, is that your thing? You come into a bar. You read some obscure passage and then pretend, you pawn it off as your own idea just to impress some girls and embarrass my friend? See, the sad thing about a guy like you is in 50 years you're gonna start doing some thinking on your own and you're gonna come up with the fact that there are two certainties in life. One, don't do that. And two, you dropped 150 grand on F, an education you could've got for $1.50 in late charges at the public library. Vickers was well known to historians throughout the states. His award-winning 1994 book Farmers and Fishermen, Two Centuries of Work in Essex Country, Massachusetts, 1630-1830, a delineated through painstaking analysis of archival records of entire communities the extent to which the development of New England had depended on labor that was largely unfree, with workers held in check not by slavery but by onerous burdens of debt. It had been hailed by reviewers as one of the best works yet written on the early American economy and as a book that explained the deepest inner workings of New England society. Truth in the World, Kant, and Aristotle. On the philosophy of the problem of knowledge, truth, belief and knowledge there is an extensive collection of notes to my poem, Reality is Infinity is Love is Infinite Immanuel Kant contrasts apodictic with problematic and assertoric in the critique of pure reason on page A70-B95. Apodictic or apodictic, ancient Greek, biomicron delta epsilon iota kappa tau iota kappa sigma, capable of demonstration, is an adjectival expression from Aristotelian logic that refers to propositions that are demonstrable, that are necessarily or self-evident live case or that, conversely, are impossible. One apodicticity or apodixis is the corresponding abstract noun, referring to logical certainty. Apodictic propositions contrast with assertoric propositions, which merely assert that something is, or is not, the case, and with problematic propositions, which assert only the possibility of something being true. Stephen opened with a quote from Plato. I will offer one from Aristotle. Physics, Aristotle, Part 8. If the art of shipbuilding were in the wood, ships would exist by nature. Or more particularly. It is absurd to suppose that purpose is not present because we do not observe the agent deliberating. Art does not deliberate. If the shipbuilding art were in the wood, it would produce the same results by nature. If, therefore, purpose is present in art, it is present also in nature. The best illustration is a doctor doctoring himself, nature is like that. It is plain then that nature is a cause, a cause that operates for a purpose. So on the usury point and ancient wisdom. There are two sorts of wealth getting, as I have said, one is a part of household management, the other is retail trade, the former necessary and honorable, while that which consists in exchange is justly censured, for it is unnatural, and a mode by which men gain from one another. The most hated sort, and with the greatest reason, is usury, which makes a gain out of money itself, and not from the natural object of it. For money was intended to be used in exchange, but not to increase at interest. And this term interest, which means the birth of money from money, is applied to the breeding of money because the offspring resembles the parent. Wherefore of a modes of getting wealth this is the most unnatural. Aristotle, Politics, 1.10, 1258 b. The monetary and financial system of an economy are part of the socio-politico-economic control mechanism used by every state to connect the economy with the polity and society. This neural network provides the administrative means to collect taxes, direct investment, provide public goods, trade. The money measures provide a crude but serviceable basis for the accounting system which in turn, 
along with the codification of commercial law and financial regulation are the basis for economic evaluation and the measurement of trust and fiduciary responsibility among the economic agents. A central feature of a control mechanism is that it is designed to influence process. Dynamics is its natural domain. Equilibrium is not the prime concern, the ability to control the direction of motion is what counts. Money and financial institutions provide the command and control system of a modern society. The study of the mechanism, how they are formed, how they are controlled and manipulated and how their influence is measured in terms of social, political, and economic purpose pose questions not in pure economics, not even in a narrow political economy, but in the broad campus of a political economy set in the context of society. Martin Schubick. When the debate is lost, slander becomes the tool of the loser. Socrates. I have endeavored to provide something of a Socratic dialogue and finish with two quotes handed down to us through Plato and Aristotle. The secret of happiness, you see, is not found in seeking more, but in developing the capacity to enjoy less. Socrates